Good evening, everybody. Uh... Hello. Oh, sorry, you hung Hello. there for a second or two, Scott. I was just about to panic. <laughs> well, I don't know if that was me or you, but I think what we'll say from the get-go is if, uh, if the internet drops out, just bear with it. It works out in the end. It's always worked out. It's not failed me yet, touch wood. So how are you, sir? You, do you doing good? I'm doing good, yeah. I'm doing good. Looking forward to doing a couple of whiskeys tonight with you. Yeah, yeah, me too. It's uh, It's been a while since we've had a chance to get a dram together, um, whether it be virtually or in real life. So looking forward to this tonight. Yeah, it's a few weeks, well, a few months now, I suppose. And early lockdown, we did it on a more regular basis, but it's it's sort of uh, tailed off this, leave, this last while over the summer. But uh, it's good to get back sitting here on a Friday night with a couple of glasses ready to ready to go. Yeah, looking forward to it. And we've got a couple of great drams tonight. So what we'll be doing tonight, we'll be trying our new UK exclusive, um, which is a limited release that we've is now in stores. And it's a wonderful uh, fino matured uh, tomato, which is quite a, a unique thing for us. And um, then in the second half of the show, we're going to be chatting a little bit about your 30th anniversary in the whiskey industry. And we found a dram that's quite fitting for that occasion as well. So, um, but before we get into all that, how how are things going at the distillery? It's been a little while since we've had a chance to tell give folks an update as to what we've been doing. Yeah, it's actually quite good. Um, we're not back to normal by any stretch, but we're back mashing, distilling. You know, production is more or less back to normal. The weather seems slightly different. Um, in that we've not got the whole squad in working full time. It's sort of two separate teams to help them have their own sort of working bubbles type idea. But um, strangely enough, it's actually given us an opportunity to do other things. Before we started up production and where and again, we actually had some of the guys in doing a bit of painting, tidying up and such like. So the, the place is looking quite neat and tidy now. Uh, and when we did start up, it actually gave us the opportunity to look at different things. Um, instead of doing some long and some short fermentations, every week we run a trial of doing purely long. So we would basically mash one week, distill the next. Um, and that has actually worked out quite well for us. It gives us more of the lovely fruity characteristics that we look for in the new make spirit. So we've actually continued that um, right. since the trials um, and will continue right up until the, the end of this year. It also gave us the chance to look at some different malt varieties. There's a new one we tried, and we're actually back on it again to a certain extent, but we tried a couple of weeks of Diablo um, as a new variety of barley, which was malted for us. Um, it gave us some tremendously good yields, and the spirit quality was excellent as well, so good news. It's because it's a new variety, there wasn't enough to actually satisfy our demand for it. But what we've now got is a mix of Diablo and Laureate, coming in on a regular basis, it's about 50-50 mix of the two. Um, so again, that's something a bit different that's all come around because of COVID. So even out of the worst case scenarios, you always get something interesting cropping up in the distilling industry, so it's good. Yeah, a little bit of a silver lining there. I think um, yeah. probably somewhere we, where we've been quite fortunate is that we don't run to capacity all the time. So things like this, we've not had to play catch up as much as um, we maybe would if we were a full capacity distillery. We've got to play about a little bit. So that's pretty nice to see. Yeah, it is. it's something different in, in some ways that we had a normal, <coughs> excuse me, with a normal sort of um, summer shutdown around about Easter time at the start of lockdown. And then when we did open up again at the end of June, we continued right through summer. So we're actually not going to be far short of our target for the year. Uh, when we work up till Christmas now. And, and we've actually done that by working a normal five-day week. We've not had to consider working weekends and things like that. So, yeah, but because we've got such a, a big distillery, but a, a relatively small output from it in, in relative terms, um, it has actually worked out quite well and quite okay for us. Whereas some of the, the bigger distilleries or smaller distilleries with, with arguably bigger brands and needing the more volume, it's been a major problem for them because you can't create more days in the week if you're working 24-7. So, so no, we're, we're being in a good position as far as that goes, yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see in years to come, you know, kind of what 2020 uh, distilled whiskey tastes like and see what other companies have been doing as well and trying to bounce back and things. But we are, of course, not alone tonight. We, we're going to be joined by a couple of folk on screen, but we've also got um, several people uh, joining in from home who have 
either already managed to get hold of a bottle of our UK exclusive. And uh, we've also got some people who have uh, won sample kits as, as well to the drams that we're trying tonight. So looking forward to hearing uh, what you think of the whiskies in the chat tonight, folks. And uh, please send in any messages and any questions. We've had loads come in ahead of time. Um, so to make sure that I'm kept on track because I'm I've got an awful tendency just to get stuck into the whiskey and the conversation. Um, Jennifer, our marketing, uh, well, our brand manager for Tomatin is uh, operating things in the background tonight. So if there's any questions that pop up, she'll forward them my direction as well and try and keep me on track. But like I say, we're going to be joined on screen as well. So we're joined by Moa, who many of you will know as Swedish Whiskey Girl. Hello. Um, hello. Hello. Um, Joined by Christopher Coates from Whiskey Magazine. Good evening, folks. How Good are you? you? Good evening. Very well, so, thanks, guys. Good. Good. Moa, um, th this is your first time on one of our sessions and things. So tell us a little bit about your kind of journey through whiskey and how you started uh, writing and blogging and now your videos as Swedish Whiskey Girl. Yeah, of course. Uh, thanks for having me, first of all. But basically, you could say it all started with a Tinder date because uh, I met my boyfriend the day before he started work in the whiskey industry. And then he brought home some samples and we kind of got to try them together. And eventually I figured that it's actually not that strong and it all doesn't taste the same. So one day it kind of just clicked and I found a whiskey that I really liked. So a few months later, I kind of started my Instagram to as a way to just kind of keep track of what I was trying and what I liked. And I'm, I really, really like taking photos and being quite creative. So it was a really good media for me to express myself. And then people kind of started coming in and wanting to just be a part of it, which is a lot of fun. And it got to a little community. And then, yeah, today it's something that I really want to pursue. So just writing about it, sharing my thoughts in quite a friendly and welcoming way. That whiskey can kind of be for everyone over legal drinking age, of course. But it, uh, yeah, it became quite a passion. I like being quite nerdy. And I think the more you learn about whiskey, the more questions you have. So it's perfect. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. So you go by the handle of Swedish Whiskey Girl, but you're, of course, based in Edinburgh as well and spent a little bit of time working in some of the whiskey institutions down there, right? Yeah, I started working at the Scottish Whiskey Experience up by the castle. And then I also worked as an events coordinator for the Scottish Malt Whiskey Society down in Leith before I decided to start up my own business, which is why I'm doing today. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, I saw that you already posted a little review of the UK exclusive and I was watching that before I was setting everything up here. So I want to jump into some of your tasting notes because they, ref they mirror quite a lot of the, the initial thoughts I had of this whiskey as well. And we're joined by Christopher Coates again. Thank you very much for coming back on, sir. You weren't scared away the first time. No, not, not too scared. I'm back. No. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's us that should be scared. <laughs> no, not at all. No, I'm, I'm very pleased to be back. Thanks for having me. No problem. Well, tell us a little bit about what's been happening in the last couple of months. A little birdie tells me that you've had a recent promotion, so congratulations on that. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I, I was recently appointed as head of content and marketing at our parent company, Paragraph, and as part of that, I'm now uh, overall editor of Whiskey Magazine too. But um, I'm, I'm very glad to be joined by a great team. So we have uh, Phoebe Calver, who is editor of American Whiskey Magazine, and Bethany Weimark, who's looking after the Drinks Report and our Gin Magazine. Uh, we also have uh, Martha Crass, who's our tasting coordinator and uh, an editorial assistant too. So we've got a great team around me. I wouldn't be able to do it without them, but um, we're very excited to sort of keep things going and evolve the magazines and, and see where we're going to end up. Yeah. Good. And how have things been going on the magazine front in the in, in this year? You know, it's been a little bit of a crazy year for every industry. How's that affected what you guys are doing? So we, were, we, we had a few issues that were delayed, but I'm very pleased to say that we haven't had to drop anything. We're continuing to publish. In fact, it's actually uh, meant that we're, we've got quite a lot happening in the, in the tail end of the year. And I'd say that while we were, uh, we had, you know, like a lot of companies, we had um, a number of members of the team that were furloughed earlier in the year, but we're all now back and, and, and straight at it. And, and if anything, busier than ever, because uh, I think certainly the whiskey industry seems to have see, had this slight hiatus earlier in the year. And now everybody's sort of, going, we've got a whole year's worth of stuff we need to do. Release, release. <laughs> so I, yeah. I think I've, I've certainly never been busier. 
Fantastic. And I've, I've seen as well that this week you've been uh, a lot of judging going on for some of the awards that you guys do as well. Yeah, exactly. So we're, we're currently in the judging process for the Independent Bottlers Challenge, uh, which is uh, our, our, one of our sort of uh, awards that we do that just looks at uh, whiskey that's been released by independent bottlers. So it's separate from the World Whiskies Awards because we think it's quite important to give independent bottlers their own time and their own platform to, to really shine separately from stuff that's been released by brands and distilleries. So, so that's what we're doing at the moment. And those results will be released in December. Well, you mentioned there, and it's a good little way to get us into our first whiskey of the evening, that, you know, the whiskey industry has had a little bit of a hiatus this year. And that kind of leads us on nicely to talk about our UK exclusive, because, you know, Tim Atten's a brand that's known for releasing limited editions every year. And of course, earlier on this year, the decision was made to kind of pump the brakes on that a little bit and hold back. But um, for the last couple of years, we've also released, as well as our limited editions globally, uh, UK exclusive and we had already selected the casks at the start of the year and our UK sales director was very keen to get this out as well so that's how we've come to the position of having this UK exclusive tonight um, so I think it's about time that we we get into that so Graham can you tell us a little bit about this whiskey? Yeah surely I mean it is an exclusive um, very much so in fact it's limited to just two casks that have actually been married together and then bottled uh, and if memory serves me right, there was about 1,700 bottles, was it, in total? Uh, less, less than that, yeah, just around. Yeah, yeah. so the, the initial spirit was laid down way back in 2006, as it would only suggest, on the box. And I've got one here. So the, in November 2006, the spirit was laid down in cask. And something that we do quite a lot of, as a lot of companies in the whiskey industry do, is... Will mature and just refill whiskey casks for the initial period. And the good thing about that is that it allows the, the natural sort of tomato flavors, the house style, so to speak, to survive. If we were to mature fully in a Fino Sherry cask, even which is that bit lighter and more delicate than an Oloroso or a PX, it would still be inclined to be a bit overwhelmed. So two days after its ninth birthday, we then transferred it across into the two Fino casks um, that we'll be trying here um, tonight. It rested in that until um, earlier this year when it was taken out and sent off for bottling um, to be distributed and was launched quite short ago. Um, it's, I can actually tell you the cask numbers, uh, were 38350 and 38351, um, so 39, sorry. Um, distilled on the 10th of November, 2006. Um, it's got 46% alcohol by volume, non-chilled filter and natural colour. And for those of you who don't have a bottle at home, I'll show you one here. Um, here's one I made earlier. Um, <laughs> there's a tremendously lovely golden colour in there. Um, it's got quite a lot of colour has come from the sherry cask. Even though Fino is a bit lighter in colour normally, it's still the, the use of the oak that made that cask that will give us some colour as well as the former contents. Um, so overall, a tremendous whisky, one that we're very proud of and very excited to be tasting tonight. Personally, I'm really looking forward to this. But I'll really be interested to hear what you guys think of this as well. I was just going to say, Christopher snuck in a very satisfying cork pop there. Is this the, the, <laughs> is this the first that uh, you've nosed and tasted here? What's your yeah. initial thoughts straight off the bat there? So... I think the first uh, the first thing I noticed there was there's, there's almost a herbaceousness to it which I which I really really like it's um and maybe perhaps a, a slight sort of almost like menthol edge to it which I think is really really interesting to have you know you, usually uh, obviously with tomato and I I expect to get lots of um lots of real really strong fruity notes which I love yeah. and and, um, and and even some and sometimes particularly on things like the legacy some cereal notes too but the, what what for sort of first started jumping out to me was sort of the the greener notes on this and it's only once you get your nose in the glass a little bit longer that some of the uh the vanillas and, and oak spices presumably from the uh from, from the again from that pheno cask are going to come through because i guess it's you're going to have this balance between the the uh the influence from the wine itself and the, yep. the biological aging process but then the new oak that was that was used because i, I guess this would have been a, a seasoned pheno cask that you'd it was yeah. ex Badigo, yeah. So it had been used a few times before, obviously. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. We we don't 
you, you don't, <coughs> excuse me, you don't get a lot of phenocast becoming available particularly. It's not like Olorosa and even PX is relatively simple to get. So it's not something we've had a tremendous amount of over the years. So for us, it's very interesting, um, maybe a bit nerdish as well, that having more unusual casks are always that bit more interesting. You can always anticipate what an ex bourbon cask is going to do for your spirit, and even an ex Olorosa sherry cask. Obviously, there's variations in them more so. But trying something different like the Fino, uh, obviously, is that bit more exciting when you go and draw samples from it. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's really quite unusual to see it. You don't, you don't see so many of them. Um, yeah over there at all it's usually the oxidative oxidatively um, aged wines that you you find yeah. cropping up in the in the whiskey industry that's much easier for you to say than it would have been for me I'm glad you <laughs> <laughs> when i when i first tried this uh, a few months back now luckily before lockdown it, it was immediately quite bewildering i find it to be quite different to the typical sort of tomato style and more like i mentioned i was watching your review just before we came on here and you had that sort of puzzlement about it as well. It was quite hard to pick apart. One of my favourite tasting notes I think I've ever heard might actually be Castle. That's an <laughs> incredible tasting note. So, uh, yeah, what do you think about this? Yeah, I think when I tried it the first time, which was yesterday uh, when I filmed the review, it was just this unique note. And straight away, I just love finding something new, something that kind of intrigues you and draws you in. And I think with this one, I got a lot of, so the way my brain works when it comes to tasting notes is that I see images, which is why the castle kind of popped up because it was more that kind of, <clears throat> it's not earthiness, but it's almost like a stone note, which was quite cold and made me think of Scottish castles. And it was, because sometimes I get a Dunnage warehouse straight away because you kind of get the oakiness and you get the alcohol and the kind of whiskey character coming through. But this was something different, which is why I think my brain just went to Castle because it had this kind of almost like romanticized feel about it. Um, so yeah, I've, I've mentioned fairy tales a lot in my tasting note lately. So I really wanted to stay away from that one. So Castle it was this time. But yeah, it's just very kind of clean and crisp and a little bit like a white wine for me as well. Mm, yeah, yeah, I'd agree. There's, there is uh, there is almost a minerality to it, which I think kind of ties into what you were saying about stone. I did uh... picking up a bit of a niece in there as well. I think, which is which is kind of which was sort of jumped out at me. Yeah, it's really Someone, interesting. There's a lot a going on. As well, uh, someone in the comments said like olives. And I thought that was mm -hmm. a very interesting one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that was something that I'm not picking it up tonight. But I did a tasting with this um, a week or so ago, and it, it came out in leaps and bounds from it. Then it was almost like that sort of a uh, sourdough bed, bread dipped in olive oil sort of thing that I was getting a really savoury side that I, a very rare finding in a tomato. And I often get a sweetness and a fruitiness, like you were saying, Christopher. But um, yeah, that that all oil element to it. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's kind of ties in with what Chris said earlier, like herbaceous, because it's almost like a herbaceous bread yep. in a way. Mm. Yeah, it's really interesting. But then underneath all that, you've you've got this sort of toffee sweetness that's that's lingering underneath. You know, these these are these green notes and the minerality sort of feel like they're sitting at the top, and then underneath, once you really get your nose in there and and spend a bit more time, the sort of the the the, the more dessert like the, the vanillas and the toffees and, and caramels start to come out too. It's yeah, that's why Sorry, more on you. No, I just want to say that's what I really find intriguing about it because the more you look into it and dive deeper, the more you find, which sometimes you with a whiskey you kind of dig deeper, but it gets to a place where you can't really find more or it's it's a little bit more maybe one dimensional, but this was very deep in character. Yeah, I've, I've just added a splash of water into mine um, just to see what effect that had. And as Christopher was speaking there about the, the sweeter notes coming through when you dig deeper, uh, they found by adding water, it seemed to soften the notes a bit and you got that sweetness coming through for definite. I saw the, <coughs> excuse me, the vanilla type um, characteristics coming through there, as you mentioned. Just seen Colin in the comments, who's obviously tasting along with us tonight, mentioning something like Brazil toffees and things like that. Yeah. That's Moa, you certainly on your video made mention of like that sort of honey element to it, and I certainly get that in abundance. That really kind of almost like a heather honey. It ties in with that sort of floral um, note to it. Yeah, really. I think 
today it feels a little bit more floral than it was on my initial kind of meeting with it. And yeah. then it was just that kind of honey, like nuttiness, mm -hmm. I felt. Yeah, it's got all that beautiful elements of phenol <laughs> sherry to it. And it's, it's you could lean towards calling it a sherry bomb, but it's not what people would expect from a sherry bomb. It's not that big Oloroso hit. It's a phenol sherry bomb, you know, that it's got... Uh, that kind of element of phenol and rama straight from the cask with the little bits of flour still in it and stuff. It's got that huge almondy sort of yeasty flavor to it. I think it's really fascinating. It's like I say, it's very different, not only from other tomatins, but other sherry matured tomatins. And Graham, we did um, phenol casks only once before in the Quattro series. And that was all about showcasing the difference between different sherry casks. But this seems to be even more so about drawing absolutely every ounce of flavour out of the phenol casks there. Yeah, it definitely. I would say this is different to the, the one in the Quattro. Uh, it wasn't, for want of a better description, it wasn't quite as extreme as this. That This one is much more unusual um, in character. Um, I find it fascinating, I have to say. It, it's absolutely lovely. I actually, I'll be honest here and say I prefer it with the splash of water. Um, I think that's actually improved it. For me, for my palate like that, it, it's it's not for everyone, but um, I think just that splash of water softens it, opens it up a bit, and I find it much more approachable and much wider range of flavours. It's a much bigger spectrum of flavours and aromas once you've yeah. added that splash of water in there. Well, our friend Gregor is in, and he's over in the States, and I think he's very, very jealous about this. I think the there might be a whiskey mule on its way to you with some UK exclusive, my friend. But uh, just to keep you getting even more and more jealous, Helen's mentioned that it's light minerals on the nose and then vanilla, doughy, and also light fruits coming through. So, yeah, summing up exactly what we're looking at there, wonderful, wonderful stuff. And, you know, Graham, you, you touched on it. Fino is not a sort of cask that we get access to an awful lot. And it's one of the – a lot of the questions that we had coming in is about the – rare use of phenol casks and mm. interestingly enough Kilhoman this week have also released a phenol cask expression using a totally different style of spirit much more peated so that'll be mm. interesting to try as well but Christopher you myself big big sherry geeks big sherry fans for those that are watching this and you're going you know why is a phenol cask so much different from an Oloroso cask that we tend to think of when we think of whiskey and even px do you want to give a little rundown as to the difference between the two or the various styles of sherry so so the easiest way to to think about this is that um in sherry production there's sort of two major avenues that you can go down and the one that you're perhaps more familiar with through uh, oloroso and and also pedro jimenez is the oxidative maturation and that's where the wines are fortified to a level that there's no um there's no chance of any of the floor that we talk about with Fino forming on the top. And, um, and the reason that that floor is so important to Fino is that it stops the, um, it stops oxidization of the wine. So all those kind of nutty flavors and, and, and also the color of the wine as well, you'll see that Oloroso gets, takes on a very dark, uh, very dark color. And that's, that's all part of this oxidation process that happens in, during the, the wine's maturation period. So you've got none of that with Fino at all. It will spend its entire life uh, maturing under this floor during what they call a biological aging. And that's where the, the wood is to some extent interacting with the uh, interacting with the wine, but that's much less of a driver in all styles of sherry. It is much more much more of a vessel that allows the transformation to take place rather than something that's actively driving flavor development, although there is there is some there is some interaction that goes on. And then there is this, again, this interaction between the layer of yeast that forms on the top itself and the wine. There's this period of transformation that's taking place. And uh, the, there, is, there is some degree of, of, uh, of oxygen interaction going on in Fino. So they'll still, what they call, run the scales in the Solera. So they'll still take the wines down the different layers of the Solera. And that does imbue it with a little bit more oxygen, but that in turn only feeds the floor. So if they weren't doing that, the floor would die. So it does still need a little bit of oxygen, but that's all being used up by that floor and therefore it's not interacting with your wine. It's not driving oxidative maturation and therefore it's not developing those sort of Christmas cakey, nutty notes that you would expect with something like an Oloroso. And it's, it's fascinating when you look at like Fino next to an Oloroso and think of the fact that they both started off as the Palomino Fino grape. It was pressed, it was fermented. It started off its life very, very similar. 
But then with that slight difference in fortification levels, they go a totally different way. And I think for a lot of whiskey drinkers looking to get into sherry, Oloroso probably is the easiest step in because it is much more in line with the flavors that you would expect from uh, whiskey. But I think for me, once I started drinking sherry, Fino is where I go nine times out of 10, an ice cold mm -hmm. bottle mm -hmm. straight out of the freezer on a summer's day. It's wonderful. And I'm reminiscing of the summer with a lot of these uh, notes in this whiskey. But, you know, Fino casks aren't something that come up so often. I'm just wondering from your uh, perspective, writing about whiskey and writing about cask use, is there anything you've come across that would suggest why it doesn't come up so often? Um, so my understanding is that it's, 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 it's driven by a few things. I mean, historically, it was um, cream sherries that were being exported to the UK in bulk. That was what people, it was these sweeter sherries that people were drinking. And they tended to be blends of, um, of Olorosos and, and Pedro Jimenez wines. And and because that was what was being imported, that was what that was what the you know that was giving you the casks that were then in the country able to be sold onto whiskey mm -hmm. make. So you tended to have these oloroso and, and cream sherries being used. Discord cask goes to the distillery, it begins uh, being used for maturation. Finos weren't historically. I mean, we're talking sort of seven. Yeah, eighteen hundreds. They weren't as popular. There were there were some dry sherries being consumed in the UK, but again, that was much more. My understanding is that was more of a more of a local thing. And I believe also that the um, the practice of, uh, of 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 sort of keeping the floor alive and doing these longer uh, biological maturations that was actually something that didn't really properly take over until until much later on as well, because it is actually very very difficult to do. Uh, to do it right and not kill the floor. It's much easier to to end up with something like, well, in theory, with something like a Palo Cortado where you've started off with the floor and then it's gone and then something's gone wrong and it died. Obviously, that's, that's how it was done in the past. It's not, I think it's quite deliberate now when they make a Palo Cortado, but um, yeah. so that's, that's one of the reasons. I think as well is that there's also this flavor preference that came from that. I mean, people were originally, they were used to drinking these Olorosos and these cream sherries. Um, it meant that if you were then migrating to a whiskey, there's something to be said for having similar flavors in two different categories of drink. And I think there's a lot of that probably still going on today. You know, sweeter, nuttier flavors, cakey kind of flavors, they're going to be quite accessible. And they're the kinds of flavors that people can kind of get on board with when they're, when they're drinking a whiskey. Fino, if you put it down in front of somebody that's not familiar with it, unless they are, a, I guess, maybe if they're a fan of very dry white wine, they might sort of their eyes might light up. But a lot of people straight away, they go, wow, this is dry. It's got a yeasty funk to it. It's, you know, it's, it's pleasantly nutty. It's got this great almondiness to it and lots of green apple. But, you know, it's it's quite something to, to try for the first time, particularly if you get something like a Mountaineer and it's got all that salinity going on with it as well. It, it can be a bit, of a, a bit of a shock to the system the first time. So I think there's something to be said of that as well. You know, this is not a normal, sherry cask profile for a whiskey and i guess it's uh you know people people work with what they what they know, yeah, and what they know well. totally agree with that something you said there kind of uh, it was quite funny you know when you actually look at the area where these sherries are made it's a tiny little part of cadiz in spain you know and actually looking at it the the extremities that you can get from there are unbelievable you know you've got pedro jimenez on the one end which is one of the sweetest wines in the world, over 400 grams of sugar, residual sugar per litre. And then you've got Fino and Manzanilla on the other end, which probably some of the driest wines you'll ever find in the world. So if you're someone that likes extreme flavours in your whiskey, wait till you start getting into sherry and stuff like that as well. But Moa, you, you mentioned you work at, worked at the Scotch Whiskey Experience and uh, SMWS, and now you're doing uh, your own reviews and shots and things. How often have you come across Fino matured uh, whiskies in the past not a lot at all uh, like you say it's it's quite rare and i think oban is one of the ones that i kind of think of immediately that is kind of a one that you can get hold of quite often but often they come out in like really limited releases and i think before i really understood what the sherry cask categories were because it's easy to hear sherry matured whiskey and then you kind of know what to expect but it's just so fascinating when you have a different type of sherry. And like I said before, the more you know about whiskey, the more questions you have. And I think for a lot of whiskey drinkers that are fast, like passionate and fascinated by flavor, the sherry world is one to explore as well. 
because if you like a sherry matured whiskey, it's also nice seeing where it comes from and learning more about these different types of sherry. And just something I thought about earlier when I tried this is that the I think the sherry style of Oloroso and Pedro Jimenez is something that really suits a Western palate because you want kind of big flavors and you want a lot. But if you compare it to something like in Japan, they often prefer a bit of a, a different style, a little bit more elegant, a little bit more, a, a bit differently balanced, I would say. Um, but you kind of can notice in some different whiskies that come from over in Asia, which I think is quite interesting. And I wonder maybe if Fino would be something that would suit another type of palette better, which is why it hasn't been brought into the Western world that much yet. Mm. But yeah, it's really interesting hearing when Chris is talking about these different types of sherries and historically why it might be that some are used more. And of course, you do see Palo Cortado, for example, quite a lot more because a lot of people use it for limited releases or as a finishing cask. So yeah, I think it's, it's an interesting world. And as a, a um, sherry matured whiskey enthusiast, look into the sherry world. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think um, you know, being over to Jerez and things, it does seem like for a long, long time, Fino and Manzanilla, these bone dry white wines were kind of hidden there. They kept a hold of that. They're like, we're, we're going to try this stuff. You you have all that sweet stuff. We're going to keep this, and it certainly seems to ring true. And I've seen some of the comments there from Jean. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. Who caught up with our um, uh, sherry special? earlier in the year, the Softer Side session, which was basically me and three friends from other distilleries dr just drinking a lot of sherry for a couple of hours and talking about the difference. And we've sent him on a little bit of a journey, which is great. But uh, his most recent, well, one of his comments there was that Fino and Manthania are a, a bit more challenging for him uh, than Oloroso and PX, but they pair very well with food. And one thing I found when I was trying this whiskey was it pairs incredibly well. And this is a food pairing that I uh, rattle on about as much as possible, but this works incredibly well with salted popcorn. Um, and, you know, you, all three of you have got a bottle in front of you now. Once we're done tonight, go and find a film and go and find some salted popcorn and uh, you can thank me next week, but it's it's a wonderful pairing there, so. Yeah, that's what's amazing. <laughs> it does. It does. It's, it's, it's very, very good. Um, Graham, let's let's talk about these phenol casks. Then you know, I think they could come across as probably from a use point of view being quite unforgiving. You know, they they let a lot of the tomato character do come through. You know, a lot of olorosos and PX can maybe mask yeah, yeah. Um, imperfections in a new mix spirit. But how did you find working with phenol casks? Um, well, as I said earlier, it's it's quite interesting. Um, so it was really quite interesting to hear both Moa and Christopher speak about the Palo Cortado casks there as well. They're very, very difficult to get a hold of, Palo Cortado. Um, so we've had a few different sherry casks um, that we've played with, for want of a better description. Um, it's supposed to be working, but we're really playing. It's, it's, it's too enjoyable. But uh, no, the, I'll be absolutely honest, when we filled them, we didn't really know what to expect coming out the other end of the maturation. Um, because when you try something new, you're never 100% sure. So, <coughs> excuse me, yes, we did do it with the, the Quattro. And obviously, we, we knew the results of that. But a one-off like that, you're never going to be sure if it's going to be repeated. Because as I said earlier, you know, cherry casks, in their, their very nature, especially the Oloroso ones where you get it from a bodega that it may be 20 years old, it may be 50 years old. You don't know what influence the wood's going to have left in it. You don't know what's going to be the result of a maturation. That's maybe becoming slightly less so now when we're all doing the seasoning of the sherry casks from new, and therefore you have a much better idea what the final product will be like once you've used the cask. But with the Fino casks, we, we didn't really know what was going to come out the other end of it. So it's it's always interesting to be involved in that. You know, we we took whiskey that was produced before I joined to Martin um, and laid down for us. So I didn't really know, I had a good idea of the history of it like, but we didn't know how that had actually matured over the years. And then again, the surprise of not knowing exactly what the Fino Sherry is going to provide. Um, it keeps life interesting. You know, if we knew exactly every time what every cast was going to supply at the end of the day, it would be a bit boring. Um, so as Moa said earlier, 
the one great thing about whiskey is the more you learn, the more you want to learn. You know, and I've been three decades in the industry now, and I would say I've scratched the surface of uh, learning about whiskey. You know, there's so much more there to to dig into and be enthusiastic about and such like that. Um, this was just another step along the way, as far as I'm concerned. That it's just it's a fantastic experience, it's a fantastic opportunity to be involved in producing something that. Okay, it may be a bad surprise if it doesn't come out well, but in this case, a tremendous surprise. You know, so I think I warbled a wee bit there. I didn't really answer your question. But. <laughs> Very political of you. Very political. I know that's, that's a tremendous effort. <laughs> just, just to clarify, so these these are actually Fino production casks, then, rather than um, rather than new oak casks that you had young wines that would become Fino put into to. to yeah, Oh, these yeah, these came from Abiga. Um, it was through a source we have over in Spain that we actually managed to get just the two of them. Um, mm -hmm. That was all that we had in this parcel. So that we were actually on that same day, I won't go into too much detail of what we got because we might use it again sometime, but we had several different casks that we filled on that one day um, when, we, when we did the racking operation into the Fino casks. So that... <laughs> It was um, ex Bodigo ones. It wasn't ones that we had had specially produced or prepared for us. It was just two that happened to become available through our sources. And that's what happens. You know, I've been, we have one supplier in Spain that we use quite regularly. And I've been asking him for the last couple of years to try and get me some Palo Cortado casks. Uh, and I'm still waiting. And he's got tremendous contacts over there. You know, so when things like this come up, you've got to grab them with both hands and see then what actually evolves as the maturation continues. And one of the, the most difficult parts, I guess, is throwing samples, nosing, tasting, and trying to decide whether it has reached its peak of perfection, or maybe another, another six months, another year would improve it. But if you leave it for another year, it may actually have gone beyond its peak. So getting the timing right is also quite interesting, challenging sometimes, but it is what keeps life interesting soon. So was it was it hogshead that was in beforehand before it was re-racked? It would have been we would normally for anything that we rack, not all the time, but ninety percent of the time, what we will use is refill hogsheads, yeah. Um, because that it's it's one of the things that I've always been brought up to believe in the industry. First fill cask, whether it be bourbon, sherry, or anything else, the former contents, the wood, everything influences the flavours greatly. Whereas if you use second, third, even fourth fill casks, which some people would reckon or sort of say are very poor, you know, the quality of wood's not great, it's tired. The great thing about using second, third and fourth fill casks is that the wood doesn't overwhelm the spirit. It allows it to breathe and you get much more of the oxidation-based flavours coming to the fore. You know, and I always feel that, that wood finishing, second maturation, call it what you want, it gets a bit of a bad press sometimes. And I think that's wrong because to me, it's just another tool in our toolbox to allow us to create different whiskies. And sometimes if you mature full maturation, 12 years, let's say 15 years, it can be overwhelming. By using a finishing technique, you allow that oxidation flavors to come through first and then complement them with different flavors to give you complexity at the end of the day. So if finishing is done right and done for the right reason, I think it's a tremendous asset to the whiskey industry. I was having a similar conversation recently, you know, talking about these refill casks and how you very rarely see whiskey matured in refill casks bottled at a younger age, a 10, a 15 year old mark, because it's probably not quite ready. It's when you're getting to that 30, 40 years that you really start to see them with that massive oxidized fruits. Yeah. But they're still used at a young age because, like you say, when it comes to finishing, they're a great workhorse and they're a great backbone to what you're going to put into your finishing cask. But even further back, Gregor's asked a question that I guess goes back to, you know, say, for example, you're sitting at the distillery and you've got a bourbon cask on one hand and a sherry cask on the other hand. Are you altering the new make spirit at all before you fill that or it's consistent spirit going into every cask? Yeah, it's consistent spirit. That, that's one of the things we try and achieve in the distillery is consistency. Um, we want to have the house style tomato new make spirit, you know, slightly sweet with lots of fruity notes in there. That's what we're trying to achieve on a consistent basis. Because if you've got a good, it's one of the things, it's another sort of saying, let's say in the whiskey industry, you can actually take a poor new make spirit, put it in good casks and get a decent whiskey out of it. 
You can take a very good new mix, but put it in poor cast, and you will only get a poor whiskey out the other end. But if you can take a really good new mix spirit and good casks, marry that all together, you're going to get something that is really nice every time. So we're always trying to be consistent within the distillery. And over the years for Tomatin, that's maybe been a bit of a challenge, you know, because we've gone 1974, the last increase in capacity. We were producing 12.5 million litres of alcohol in the course of a year. And then that was ramped down for various reasons over the years. We're now, this year, making about 1.8 million. Um, so a lot less than we used to be in the past. But it's still the same equipment we've got there. But we've, instead of running 24-7 absolutely flat out, making as much as we can, we can now take a bit more time. We can have a much more balanced distillation e equation, run the distillery in a more balanced way. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to have better spirit. It just means we will get more consistency. So that is what we're really always trying to do, is get the new make consistent that we know what our starting point is. But that may only account for 20, 30% of the final flavours. The maturation is really the key part in the grapes. It's not the most important, but it is the most influential part. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so incredible just listening to Graham talk about his spirits because it's. I think you can really tell how much he knows and how much he cares about his spirits, which I think is incredible. Because sometimes when you listen to someone talk about whiskey, it's easy that they have so many points they get, want to get across that you kind of just hear numbers and you just hear casks and you just hear all these things that, of course, are interesting to hear. But you want to get to know the people behind the spirit because they're the ones making it. And even if you have a whiskey that is bare minimum or age or older or whatever it might be, there's so much work behind it. And I think it's so wonderful just listening to someone who's been there and done it and learned about the spirit and knows kind of what to do with it to get different things and try new things. And of course, you have such a long finishing time. Just doing that as well just sets you apart, which I think is just wonderful to listen to. Oh, well, thank you very much. I'll, I'll, I'll take that as a question. Um, it's one of the things I occasionally do whiskey schools. And uh, I'll talk about maturation and nurturing spirit and such like. And the one thing that I always love about the maturation of whiskey is that science can't explain it all. And there are so many chemical reactions, and they are all chemical reactions taking place, let's be honest. But it takes place over such a length of time, and they're so complex that you cannot recreate that in a laboratory. You know, So that, that's part of the sort of dark arcs, the, the mystery, the mystique of whiskey and if we were ever to lose that and you could actually go up to a vending machine and say right i'll take some of that 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 and come out with a whiskey to your taste i think it'd be a really sad day you know i like the the mystery of not knowing you know what this whiskey was going to taste like because i'm not 100 percent sure of what the fino cask will produce that that's part of the fun as i say yeah it's very alive isn't it yeah oh absolutely yeah absolutely I'm I'm very glad, more that you like listening to Graham because if I know Graham, I think his answers to the quick fire round are going to be equally as long as that one that you just gave. <laughs> um, but there's a question coming from Luna Aaron here, and this is on refill sherry casks, which is something we do use a little bit of, but not quite as prominently as refill bourbon casks and hogsheads. And the question is do we find that refill sherry casks often? offer a more balance in terms of distillery and cast character? Yes, yes and no. The, the balance is sometimes a lot. But we will, we do some full maturation in first fill sherry casks. Um, but quite a lot of what we do is the finishing. because that exactly works very well for us. But a second fill sherry cask, that's one that we got over from Spain. We filled it once with tomato, even if it's only for two or three years. When it becomes a second fill then, that's always full maturation. We'll never use that again for the finishing because there's not enough influence left in there from the former contents. You still get the wood-driven oxidations and the wood-driven flavours and such like coming through. Um, so that, yeah, first fill we will use for finishing and full maturation. Second fill is always ma eh, full maturation. And it does give you a different character. Um, so for the likes of our 12-year-old, we will always use second fills as well as first fills. You know, because it does give you different flavours in there, but they're not as pronounced as the sherry that you would expect to come from the first fill cask. So if we're looking for a a sherry character in the spirit, second fills really struggle to do that. Um, so, yeah, they are that bit more mellow. There's less sherry influence. So 
Yeah, in, in some ways you could argue that, that that lets more of the house style show through, yes. Um, but it's, I always find that if I'm trying to influence something with sherry, I want that sherry influence to be to be seen, to be nosed, to be tasted. Um, whereas a second fill just doesn't really achieve that. Well, I think that's a perfect time to transition into our second whiskey. Um, what do you think? I can't argue with oh, no. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah. is there no God? <laughs> the, the second part of what we're doing tonight is, of course, celebrating the fact that a little under a month ago, Graham, you celebrated your uh, 30th anniversary uh, in the whiskey industry, and then a few days later to your wife as well. So two big anniversaries. If you can see uh, the date on there. Yep. That was the day. Strangely enough, by sheer coincidence, this cask was filled on the day that I started in the whiskey industry. Yeah. So that's 30 years. That, that was filled. That bottle was filled on its 30th birthday. And that was actually my 30th year in the industry. Yeah. By sheer coincidence, it was not planned. Well, I, I struggled to believe that when you first told me this story because of the fact that you're the person that picks the casks that goes into the visitor centre. But tell the story about how you found out that this was filled on the day you joined the industry. Yeah, it was completely by accident. I thought, yes, as, as Scott says, I selected the cask to go into the into the visitor centre as one of the bottom of your own range. Um, but to be honest, the, the age wasn't really the important thing. Um, so I knew it was from 1990. But other than that, I hadn't really paid much attention. It was the, the quality of the whiskey on the nose, the taste, etc., was all that we were interested in. And then the end of May last year, the last day in May 2019, I actually was invited to join the board uh, of Tamatan, uh, which is a, a great honour and privilege for me. But my children, I have a son and a daughter who both work in the industry, they decided to mark the occasion by getting me a bottle of whiskey from 1990. Um, so the obvious one to get was the tomato. Um, so my son was actually at work at the time uh, on my, on, well, when I received the bottle. So it was actually my daughter who handed it over to me. Um, so she gave me the bottle and I looked at it and I was saying thank you very much, you know, tremendous. You didn't need to do this, but, but thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and I looked at it and I went, that, that date that's on there, the date that was put in the cask, I said, did you, did you make that up? And she said, why, why is it wrong? And I says, well, no, I don't know. It's just that is the date that I actually started in the whiskey industry up at Scapa Distillery in Orkney. Uh, and it was just by sheer coincidence. And I had never noticed until that time. Um, so, you know, I've, I have in the past, I will fully admit, all the distilleries that I've worked in, I've looked through the stock profiles and, you know, I've looked for bottles or casks that have been filled on a, specific birthday or, you know, like so on my wedding day or, or things like that. Um, and I've never really found one that matches up anything particularly special. And I didn't even notice this one. You know? so, but now that I do know it, obviously, uh, it's fantastic. And I, I actually then asked for this one to be filled on its 30th and my 30th anniversary um, just this year. So it's... Uh, Absolute coincidence, but fantastic story for me to actually have. And I've now got two of them in the house. Um, and I may add to that collection yet. <laughs> well, I think uh, before we go on, we should say that there's a little bit of a celebration for everyone involved tonight going along with this. First of all, of course, we've got the UK exclusive, which I know a lot of you have already picked up a bottle from the Tomat and Web store. But of course, this is across the UK. So please, please, please support your local whiskey retailers and spirits retailers and go out and grab a bottle of this and something else for your basket while you're at it. But another thing is this cask that we're trying, of course, is one of our uh, distillery exclusive casks only available in the visitor center. At least that was the case until earlier this year where we made the casks available online. But in celebration of uh, Graham's 30th year in the industry, um, there will be a £30 discount on the first 30 bottles of this 30-year-old whiskey that are bought on the online store. I'm glad I said that before I tried it because I don't know if I'd be able to afterward. But yeah, <laughs> um, this is a whiskey that we never ever put a promotion or a price deal on. It just sits there doing its thing, maturing, uh, still in an active cask, so it's still aging as it's sitting there. 
Um, but for the first and only time ever, we're going to do a £30 discount for the first 30 people that want to buy a bottle. So uh, happy clicking, everybody. I think this is the closest you're going to get to a Black Friday deal from Tomatins. So, um, guys, let's, uh, let's have a little nose and a taste of this. I'm seeing Christopher and Mo have already tried, and Graham, I saw an astonishment on your face there. Yeah, I'll explain why. I've not cleansed my palate since I was uh, trying the, the UK exclusive, the, the Fino sherry cask there. And when I put my, <laughs> me, when I put my nose to this the first time, crunchies. Yeah. It was just the milk chocolate and the honeycomb center, crunchies. That was yeah. what I noticed first time. Really sweet. Sweetness came across very, very strongly there. So that's what took me by surprise because I had never noticed that in this cask before. Yeah, I think what we should say about this cask as well is a little bit about the maturation. You know, we talked a lot about refill casks at the 30-year-old mark. This is one of those incredibly rare examples at Tomatin of a 30-year-old fully matured in first fill bourbon barrels. Yeah. We started buying much more first fill bourbon barrels after we bought the Antiquary brand in 1996. Uh, but prior to that, there was a lot of refill casks and a lot of, you know, there would be the odd sherry casks and bourbon casks coming in. Um, but for a fully matured 30-year-old first full bourbon, um, don't know about you guys, but my sample is at 57.5% as well. So it's a cask yep. strength. Yep. No, crunchies. Still getting crunchies. Those, though. I mean, there's no, this is just, it's just all aroma, no alcohol, sort yep. of you know, harsh alcohol burn there at all, you know. Yeah, it's a bit like pineapple cream and pine forest for me. Yep. Yeah, yeah. My, my first thought was sort of, you know, like you just walked into a very well polished study in an old Victorian home. You know, there's, there's definitely lots of that sort of furniture polish going on. All that milk that you're talking about too. And almost looking, looking at your backdrop there, Christopher, it sounds like you've just walked into your living room is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> smelling, smelling my room. No, it's, um, and then I think there's a there's definitely something tropical going on here too. I mean, it's 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 not quite lilt, but it's getting there. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit like that tomato character that you're expecting a little bit of tropical notes and that kind of big fruitiness, and then you just turn up the volume. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. But it's been um, a perfect moment because you know, there's with with with, with whiskies when they start getting into this the, these older age categories and the, and these tropical notes start coming through and sometimes the the sort of like greenhouse notes can start emerging and and if those if the things get left for too long it sort of goes tropical tropical then it's kind of like greenhouse sort of tomato stem kind of skunky kind of smells and then it just falls off and then it can completely fall off into you know you feel like you're at the compost heap or something and it's just and it's just wonderful that if you, if you catch them just before they're going into that direction you get these incredible elegant notes that it is. It's, it's the complexity again, and that comes with age. You, you can't speed it up. You know, I, I once had a conversation with Ed Dodson that used to be manager at Glen Murray, and Ed was in the industry for 40 plus years, and he came up with this idea that he was going to moor a barge off the coast of Scotland and put all the whiskey cask out in it because the motion of the waves would actually make the maturation speed up, which it would. But it would only be the wood driven maturation. It wouldn't be this oxidation, the years and years of complex reactions that give you this tremendous sort of complexity in here. Mm. Strangely enough, Ed never did do that. Yeah, I think uh, we're still talking a, about it. <laughs> a tasting note there from Helen, who's obviously got the samples at home, um, that really stands out for me, and that's apple pie. And it, it's, it's almost like that cooking apples on the stove type of thing that I'm getting from the nose. I just had a taste of it, and it's one of those whiskies that I could nose and nose and nose for half an hour, but I thought I will give it a try just so I get the edge on you guys. And um, it's, it totally flips up, and it gets so much, like, it tastes aged. You know, there is, it's, it's weird because the things that I'm tasting, I can only recognize as smells. They're not things that I've ever eaten before, but it has that sort of dunnage warehouse that, cigar box um secondhand bookstore sort of thing going on all with that fruity notes going on at the same time but they're not things i've ever tasted but that's the feeling that i'm getting from this yeah it feels very alive because i think sometimes with age you still want the character to come through and feel very much alive like chris said you get to a point where it just gets to this golden point and then if you tip over the edge you might 
go a little bit too far but where this sits it just feels like it's alive because it keeps coming at you like a big explosion and then you just taste it and taste it because mm. it just keeps changing and it I have this weird thing of describing whiskey as a color and I know a lot of people do that as well and this is just very golden mm -hmm. yeah yeah I know what you mean. On the I added a good splash of water to mine, and uh, I found now that as soon as I did that, note it, I get real citrus, almost like it's not a lemon, it's in a, a bitter lemon, but a quite a, a, a sweet lemon type characteristic with very citrusy on the nose now. I'm gonna ha I'm gonna leave it a while. I think I'm gonna let it sit and just give it a bit of time for a while, and then. Maybe add a bit of water to it, but obviously this is a whiskey that we're going to keep going back to and picking out more and more flavors. So let's say uh, let's continue asking some of these questions and see what we see what the whiskey tastes like in a little bit. But you know, we know that um, whiskey from the '90s is increasingly rare because it was quite a turbulent time in the industry, particularly before 1995 when. Uh, some crazy guys decided to build a distillery on Aaron and kind of start that revolution for building new distilleries. But up until 1995, the whiskey industry was still struggling. And Graham, I know from your history in the industry, you you, you lived through that and you saw the, the 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 real pitfalls of that a couple of times. I did, yeah. I mean, as I say, I started at Scarpa. I mean, Orkney, that, that's where I'm from. That's hence the strange accent. Um, but I I refused when I left school. I refused to go to university. Um, because it meant leaving Orkney. And there was no way, why, why did I want to leave, you know, the centre of the universe as far as I was concerned? And then, whilst working for Scarpa, the decision was made by Allied Distillers, who owned it at the time, that they were actually going to close it down. Um, so this took place in 1993, and it actually stopped production completely in December 93. Um, now, at that stage, I was working as a trainee brewer, and the... They called everyone in and told them what was going to be happening and then they took me into a side room and said well you've heard what's happening but that's not going to impact on you because we're actually going to move you down to Glendronach um, as a brewer. So yeah fine. So myself, my wife and my one-year-old son at the time um, moved to Aberdeenshire to Glendronach. So moved there as brewer and lo and behold then in 1996 exactly the same thing happened there. Um, they took the decision to close it down. So I was beginning to start thinking there was a wee bit of a Jonah here, that everything I touched was turning to closed distilleries. Um, but I managed <coughs> excuse me, I managed to convince the powers that be at Glenmorangie um, that they should take me on. So I left Allied at that time and went to Glenmorangie as assistant manager. And about a year and a half into that, I then got promoted up to the distillery manager. Um, I tried my best to shut it down, but in actual fact, ended up increasing production there um, during my time. I then had the opportunity, which seemed a strange move, uh, but it's one given the chance again, I would probably do again, to actually move and instead of closing down the distillery, reopen one, uh, which had been closed for 22 years, which was Glen Glasser Distillery over near Port Soy. So moving there, I still remember the first day I went in um, to work, which was actually the first of April. I don't know if that was poignant or not, but but uh, I stood on the balcony in the still. I was looking down at these two wrecked stills that thieves had trying to cut copper off and all the pipe work hanging off the wall. And I thought, what have you done? But um, as the year went on and we eventually got it all back into working condition, the sense of achievement, the first day that the first mash went in, was absolutely amazing. You speak to a lot of distillers, and it's maybe because I spent more time as a mashman than it is a stillman, but a lot of distillers will say it's the first day you run spirit, you talk a sample out of the safe, and you notice it, and it's good. To me, the perfect day was the first mash going in when everything actually worked, and you got that lovely, warm, malty smells in the mashings. It was tremendous. But then after after a few, well, I was there for about three and a bit years, um, the challenge had worn off with the initial project, uh, and that's when Bob Anderson, who was chief executive at, at Tomatin at the time, asked if I would like a, a change of role and become a general manager at, at Tomatin Distillery. So I went and had a meeting with him and Stephen and spoke about it and decided, yeah, that, that was a good good move for me. So that's nine years ago, past in August, that I joined, joined Tomatin. Um, so I've been very lucky um, to have worked in some tremendous distilleries 
but really with tremendous people. It's the people that make the distilleries, it's people that make the whiskey. So I've been very lucky to work with a lot of great people, met a lot of really interesting characters over the years. Um, and given my life to live over again, I don't think I would change anything, to be honest. You know, so I'm in a very fortunate position to be able to say that. You know, it's uh, it's been a great life for me so far, and hopefully I've got a few miles left in the tank yet. I was going to say, you know, after after 29 years, you could probably... Oh, uh, you handle me there. I was doing one of my tricks. <laughs> uh, like, after 29 years, you could probably made a claim to see just about everything the industry had to offer. And then 2020 came around and said, exactly. I keep going to close, Mr. Eunson. But, you know, you touched on it a little bit earlier on. And when we're talking about a whiskey like this 1990, which was, as you say, filled into the cask the first day you drove up to Scapa Distillery, you had no influence on making this whiskey other than uh, picking it for the visitor centre. What yeah. is it like? been the guy in charge of the work that people have done for you know in our case over 50 years of distilling and laying casks down that's a incredible responsibility that you've got yeah it, it is yeah i mean again very fortunate you know i can to a certain extent can walk into the distillery and take credit for what the guys did you know 30 years ago um because what they've laid down is what now i can sort of reap the riches of but that's, that's, it was once described to me by a, a, a former director at, at Teacher's um, Whiskey, actually. Um, his view on the people in the whiskey industry is that we are purely custodians, that we come into a distillery. It's been there 100 plus years before us, and hopefully it'll be there for several hundred to come. So all we can do is look after it while we're there. And that's, that's for everyone who works in the distillery so that we can look after the casks that the previous generations have laid down, make sure that they're you know, cared for, and we can then select from that and actually get into the bottle so that other people all over the world can enjoy it. And at the same time, try and make the new make spirit and select the casks for filling to lay that down for future generations to come as well. So I think I was actually speaking to Janice, our distillery manager, about it the other day when I was in. And we both have a similar mindset that we feel that it's our duty to try and not only look after the distillery so that it's in every bit as good shape as it was when we came there, but actually try and leave it slightly better for the next generation to come as well. So, yeah, it's a, it's a strange one, getting this whiskey that I had no involvement in. Um, I mean, some of our oldest whiskies, I was still at school. In fact, I was barely even at school when some of the older ones were, were put in the cask. You know, so that it's a it's an unusual industry that you're you're using products made many many years before you were ever anywhere near the place, but you still have to take due care and attention of them, marry them together, get them into the bottle at just the right time, and all that. So I don't I don't really think of it as a responsibility. I think of it more as a a passion. Um, it's something that's enjoyable. You know, so responsibility probably, but but not really. It's too enjoyable to be a responsibility. Um, we're ab speaking of enjoyable. We're about to jump. Into, we're about to jump into a uh, Graham Yunson quick fire round. But before we do that, Christopher Moa, you've been nosing and tasting those whiskies as Graham's been talking about that incredible career. What are you thinking of this? How's it changing for you? It's kind of becoming a bit more like toffee sauce for me. Just a really kind of luxurious dessert. Yeah, yeah, I'd completely agree that the, it's those the really really sweet dessert notes have been have been sort of building the longer it stays in the glass. And that you know, there's I can't quite decide if it's sort of like milky bar, you know, like white chocolate that kind mm -hmm. of thing, or maybe even into like the realms of like butter icing and things like that. It's um, it's really there's a, that that sweetness is is really really pronounced. And mm -hmm. I think. What, remarkable on the palate as well as sometimes when you start getting into these older whiskies you can have these immensely complex flavors but then sometimes you start to get this sort of bit this bitterness at the back of the palate and this doesn't have that there's this remarkable sweetness to it and it and it just keeps going with you you know there's none of those you know it, and, it, and it, even as some of the flavors begin to fade none of that um you know, none of those off notes that you sometimes get with older whiskey there's just none of it there it's incredibly clean still yeah yeah it, it, i'm, I'm 
thoroughly enjoying it, thoroughly enjoying it. It's one of those whiskies that you rarely get a chance to just, you know, when nobody in the visitor centre is looking, just take a little glass over to the cat and have a little go of. But uh, this is the first time I've ever been able to sit down with it at home and just really enjoy it like this. But as I said, a quick fire round. How did that come about? Well, in the run up to this, when we were uh, doing the competition for the sample packs, what we wanted to do was get as many questions from uh, the fans as possible. Uh, and a lot of them, of course, have been towards Graham with his 30th year in the industry. And um, what we thought we'd do is ask them very quickly so that we weren't here until tomorrow. Um, but what I wanted to do is, as we're going through, get you guys to kind of jump into any of the subjects that you personally find interesting and kind of interrogate, interrogate Graham a little bit more. I'm aware that opening that up, we could be here quite some time, but let's get into it. Graham, are you ready? <laughs> Um, um, yes, I'm ready. I'm ready. So the one question that we got asked quite a lot was, for you personally, what sets Tomatin apart? Now, I don't know um, if that means your other distilleries or the industry as a whole. Um, it's, it's a very difficult question to answer. Um, for me personally, because I have more responsibility, I have more say in what happens it's the one that i've had the ability to play with most if that makes sense you know i've, I've had more influence over what is done and how it's done but that's a, that's a, almost a sort of selfish thing um the the thing that really sets it apart it's the same as all distilleries it's the people really um that are the key things yes all the plant and equipment is slightly different but the people are the biggest difference and then the actual whiskey itself, because um, you can you could build almost three identical distilleries, place them slightly different places, and they would create different spirits. And uh, science is at a loss to actually explain all of that. You know, so it's it's a very difficult one to nail down what sets it apart. It's just so many small variables um, that are involved in that. But the people are the biggest variable because they do always different. Different people, different sites have different attitudes to life, you know, and such like. And we're probably unusual now that we've got 29 houses on site where quite a large percentage of our staff actually live there. So it's it's not just a place of work, it's actually their home, it's where their families live and everything else. So that in itself can be a double-edged sword. Um, but in in the most, I would say it's a very positive thing. So, yeah, the, the people would be the, the main one. That was a very, very long answer to a relatively short question. It should be a long time. Answer that. Um. No. Uh, okay, so next question was, and I think you might have answered it actually when you were talking about Glen Glassic, but the next question was your best day at work over the last 30 years. Um, what's 30 times 365 and a quarter? Because that, that, that's the best day. I, I would hate to actually choose a best day. Uh, obviously, my first day was good. Um, when I became a mashman, when I became a stillman, when I became a brewer. Uh, I do remember when I was at Glen Morgan's as assistant manager, Bill Lumsden coming back up the road from that meeting in Edinburgh. Um, and we met outside the mashers door at half past 10 at night. And he explained to me after saying what was happening with the company, what was happening with him, he actually explained that I was going to become Glen Morgan's distillery manager. And that was a bit of a wow moment that was unexpected. Um, there was that day at Glen Glasser, yeah, getting the first mash going. But there's also, you know, so many other other events. One of the best ones I've had at Tomatin was the day that I first went upstairs and where he's six and drew a sample of that blue ended 1976 cast. You know the ones. You know, know. That was, wow. You know, so that I, I couldn't nail down one day uh, as being the best day. There's just been far too many of them. Well, I think you've answered a question that's come in as we were chatting there. George asked if you had a secret barrel that you like to take a sample from, and is that where? Okay. Directions. <laughs> where exactly is it? <laughs> where, how? Uh, take a first left. <laughs> obviously, obviously, all of these samples are duty paid. In case there's anyone from HMRC watching, <laughs> <laughs> every single one. Every single one. Um, <laughs> Another question, and I'm sure this one could lead to a long answer, but was how has the industry changed over the last 30 years? Um, it's, I think there's less characters now, but that's, 
<coughs> excuse me. That's maybe because I've got older, and some of the some of the old time guys that I when I first joined, you know, that were the high up in the industry. Let's say there were some real characters there. I don't think there's quite so many of them now as there was. There's still a few out there kicking about, but that's maybe because I remember it through rose tinted specs. Um, there's less people because automation has taken its place in quite a lot of aspects of the industry. So again, I remember, <coughs> excuse me, I remember playing football in the, the Malt Distillers Association seven sides. We had curling, we still play golf, although there was none of that this year because of COVID. But that used to be big, big events that there was, you know, dozens of teams involved in it and all of that seems to have disappeared, which all sounds kind of negative. Um, but the one thing that I don't think has changed is the, the the sort of the passion, the enthusiasm that the people who work in the industry still have. It's a very, very friendly industry. You know, and I'm not just talking about people in the one distillery getting on with their colleagues. It's the entire industry. We all meet up. We all shoot the breeze. We we share some secrets. We we share, you know, spare parts. Um, we share information when it comes to all the legislation, you know, whether that be SEPA or the Health and Safety Executive. We'll all let one another know what's happening and how it's impacting on us so that they can prepare before it impacts on them. So the, the friendliness of the industry is still there, and I hope that never changes because I think it must be pretty unique, you know, to have at least two associations, the, the Malt Stills Association, which is 146-year-old, and the Scotch Whiskey Association, and to have that two bodies working so much together on the united front to represent the industry and help one another out you know that's one change i hope will never ever happen so yeah there's been some changes there less character less people but there's a lot of things that are still continuing and long may they do so yeah yeah um the whiskey you're most proud of That one, that one. <laughs> it's like it's like trying to choose choose a child. Uh, I'm lucky I've got a favourite son, a favourite daughter, because I've only got one of each. Um, trying to choose your favourite whiskey or the one you're most proud of, that's, that's very difficult. Um, I guess if I had to choose one, uh, and this may come as a bit of a surprise, it would probably be Legacy to my legacy, or Kubokan, because that's really the only two expressions that are relatively mainstream that I've had total input from, from, from day one. You know, I've been involved in the whole process. Yes, the limited editions um, are, are also one-offs and such like, but, but legacy is one that was developed while I was at Tomatin from day one. Uh, and the fact that, you know, it, it's relatively young, and I'm letting away a secret here is less than nine year old because it's the whiskey that we use was actually produced in my time there as well. So, so that one um, is one that I am quite proud of because I think it's a tremendous whiskey for the the position that it's at. And Kubokan is the same. Uh, I really do love the the Kubokan. I think it's a fantastic whiskey. Now, some of that was made before I joined, but even still, the recipe of putting all that together, I was involved in heavily. So the, these two are two that have been highly involved in the the development, <coughs> excuse me, of the whiskey that they went into the bottle. So I, I would probably claim them because I've had the most involvement with them, but it's a very difficult one to answer. Yeah, and so, uh, sorry, I'm, uh, I was also curious for Graham to, if he, for you, of course, everyone thinks different things about whiskey and have their personal preference, but I was wondering if you have a personal preference for maybe a specific cask or a specific age or, I don't know, ABV or something for the Tomatin spirits. Um, well, it, it, again, this is personal preference, and it's not really purely for tomato. It's for most whiskies. If I had to take, if I had a choice of a cask um, to put whiskey in to take to a desert island, it would actually be a first fill ex bourbon because that's the style of whiskey that I like. I'm not a huge lover of sherry cask matured whiskies. I quite like them, but given the choice, I would always go for a, an ex bourbon. But if I had to choose a favourite cask, it's that 1976 one that I spoke about earlier in number six warehouse, um, because it is amazing. It is unbelievably complex. It, it's the best whiskey I've ever tasted. 
and I've been fortunate to taste quite a lot of very good whiskies over the years as well. So I don't know if that answered your question. No, that's brilliant. We'll look forward to trying some when uh, when all this <laughs> COVID mark is over and we can get up the road. <laughs> yep. Not the we'll be chopping on the door. <laughs> He said it had a blue end. Where is it? <laughs> uh, this no, is colour blind. Yeah. It'll be, just it'll be like, thing like the at the end of Indiana Indiana Jones. You know, you'll go into the warehouse and they're all going to have blue ends. <laughs> <laughs> On something like legacy, you're saying as well, Graham. You know, uh, I think it's it would maybe be easy to think that something like the Tomatin fifty year old would be an easy answer, but. Something like Legacy, where it's grown to become our second biggest seller worldwide, it introduces so many people to tomato, and I think it's something that is I, I absolutely should be proud of. It does so so yeah. much work for for us as a, a company and a brand. So yeah, incredible uh, liquid and um, whiskey there. And a similar question, but slightly different, was the cask or casks that you're most excited about releasing. Again, that's that's a, a difficult one. The ones that I have the most fun with, as I said earlier, are the, the more experimental or the more unusual, you know. So whether that be the, the Fino or if I can get my hands on the Palo Cortado, you know, or even the first time that we, we started using the virginal casks, you know, was, was quite interesting. Um, so that it's... I it's not an easy one to answer. I did think about this earlier because he did send it through to me, but it's not something that I can really say that one is any more so than the other. The ones you do get excited about is obviously the ones that you have less knowledge or less um, idea of what the whiskey is going to be like um, when it comes out of it. You know, so we do we do have some quite unusual casks. And probably this isn't the right sort of forum for mentioning all of them because we have to keep some of them under under wraps meantime um, because they could be being launched in the, in the not too distant future. Um, but yeah, the, the cask casks that I get most excited about, it's still that blue ended one up in number six. <laughs> I'm getting very, very thirsty for a drama of that. I have six, you say. <laughs> yeah, have you written it down, Chris? I remember it. <laughs> I'm we're, we're all, these, all these clues, you just need to keep bringing it up, and and it says so. So you, you come to it from the left, and it's in warehouse <laughs> six. Okay, just so need to know he's kept his, there. <laughs> his biggest clue there was upstairs because there's only two floors ground and up. So oh, you've, you've got <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. a that being uh, answering questions very quick. It's just going to be a yes and a no from now on. <laughs> We're going to have to put a crew together, Ocean's Eleven style. <laughs> um, a question that came in from uh, Luna Aaron as we've been chatting is, what do you most like about and most like in your job? Um, all of it. All of it. There's, well, not all of it. There's always the odd day here and there when there's things that you have to do or, or things happen that you would prefer didn't. But... <clears throat> It's it's a very it's a very different job to what I anticipated it would be. Um, <coughs> excuse me. When you work on the shift side of things in production, it can be quite repetitive. A lot of jobs can actually be very repetitive. But having moved from production side, actually on the shop floor, hands-on type thing into more of the, the management side. Um, that is a, a role that no two days are ever the same. You know, you, you can be touring people from anywhere in the world explaining about about the, the whiskey and how it's made. You can be involved in trying to find casks. You can be involved in breakdowns, you know, getting your hands dirty, covered in, in grease and oil and such like. Um, and it's the, it's the variety of the job, as I think what actually I enjoy most. And opportunity. I mean, I've, I've been lucky. I've travelled all over the world, as far west as California and Vancouver, as far east as Japan. You know, and all I've had to do is uh, fly around the world and then drink whiskey and speak about it. It's a hard life. It's a really hard life. You'll you'll be glad for the break that we've had this year, eh? Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it, I was so needing it. <laughs> 
have your tastes changed over the last 30 years? Um, probably, yeah. I think everyone's does. I think, um, you know, when I was younger, I preferred, you know, a cheeseburger and chips. Um, now I would like to think that I'm slightly more cultured in my, my tastes when it comes to food. And uh, having said that, my favourite food's always been scallops and that'll never change. But uh, but yeah, I, th I think your, your sense of your tastes do change. Um, and I think that's natural. And that's maybe why whiskey can sometimes be perceived as a more older or more mature person's drink. Because sometimes the younger palate just can't appreciate it. And that, that's being very stereotypical here because I know there are massive exceptions to that. But I think as you do get into your later 20s, 30s, 40s, um, your palate starts to appreciate whiskey and maybe the finer things in life as well. The more you get to experience them, the more you want to experience them. And therefore, your taste will change as you get that opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Um, Favourite food pairing? Um, probably Kubokan and scallops. That's Ooh. amazing. The in the Kubokan and scallops. You, you can't beat scallops. It, it is my favourite food. Margaret will agree with me on that. Okay. She doesn't like fish, so it's even better. I get them all. <laughs> um, now, th this was a question that I wasn't expecting to ever ask anyone. I know you've got a favourite enzyme, but what is your favourite type of warehouse? I'd be surprised if I said palletised. 100%, we've not got any. <laughs> <laughs> I have worked with them in the past. No, dunnage. You cannot beat a dunnage warehouse. Um, the thick stone walls, the low ceilings, the earthen floor. It's how whiskey was matured for many, many decades, even hundreds of years. Uh, and I still think it is the best. You know, racked where it says it gets too hot at the top. The, the maturation speeds up on a hot, sunny day. Okay, thankfully, we don't get many of them in Scotland, but when it does happen, it affects the maturation. So, that um, no, the, the Dunnage Warehouse would be my favourite style. Unfortunately for the, the financial side, they're extremely expensive for all the casks you get into them because the most expensive part of any building is the roof. So the more you can fit under a roof, the better. But no, a Dunnage Warehouse will always be my favourite style. And and Luna of, is, of course is asking the the question: What you, is your favourite enzyme? Limit dextrinase. Do you want me to explain? No, I do. I, I actually think the explanation is quite good. <laughs> it's very uh, very geeky. It is very geeky. Yes, it's it's quite sad, really. No, limit dextrinase should be killed off at forty odd degrees centigrade, um, because that's its maximum threshold temperature. But in reality, it survives through the mashing process, uh, which is, you know, 60, 64.2 degrees centigrade, um, survives right through and actually continues to bake down the, the dextrins um, in the fermentation during the, or during the, the fermentation in the washbacks, I should say. So the very fact that it's a bit of a maverick because it should have been killed off in the mash tun, but survives through into fermentation. That, that's why it's my favorite enzyme, yeah, which is, just shows how sad I really am, and I do need to get out more, yes. It's my favourite enzyme now as well. Oh, I do. <laughs> and we all have a favourite enzyme. <laughs> the, the last question, the last quick fire question, but this might be one that takes a little bit of uh, explanation, was do you have any um, plans for changes at Tomat in the years to come? Um, from the whiskey side of things, no, as far as the, the new spirit and all that goes. Um, from the, the maturation side, yeah, I would love to get a hold of some more unusual casks and have a bit of a play around and such like um, with that. But I, I don't think I'm unique in, in that. I think uh, we all enjoy things like that. So I've not got any plans to make major changes to what the, you know, the end product will be, um, other than maybe slightly different expressions of it. The distillery itself is needing a bit of investment um, because the buildings, we need a few new roofs and warehouses. You know, some of the drains are needing to be repaired and things like that. But that's that's part and parcel of operating a distillery. You know, it doesn't matter when it was built, there will always be repairs and maintenance to be done. So on the fabric of the buildings, yes, I would love to make a lot of changes, but there's a, a small problem that it, it takes quite a bit of cash to do that. So 
I'll have to be patient and do it over time. But for the for the actual whiskey in the bottle, yeah, small ones here and there, something different. But the, the core expressions will remain pretty much the same as they are now, I would imagine. Um, it's one of the things, never say never. We may have to change a 12-year-old into a five-year-old and see how that goes. But I don't think I don't think I would stay in my role very long if I suggested that one. <laughs> well, I hope that somebody from the Guinness World Records has been on because I'm glad to tell you that the world's longest quick fire quiz has come to an end. <laughs> <laughs> so, Christopher Moore, obviously a, a huge amount of information there. And I, I'm very fortunate to work closely with Graham and get to tap into that source of knowledge quite regularly. So I'm going to step back. And if you guys have got any questions that you would like to ask Graham, please feel free. Now is the, the time. Well, I think, I think one that's always useful is um, is talking a little bit about the difference between the, the peated and the unpeated spirit that you have. You know, if, if, you, if you were to characterise the unpeated spirit style, you know, people talk about green grassy or, or oily or, or malty spirit or nutty spirit. How would you characterise both the, uh, the, the unpeated and the peated spirits that you produce at the distillery? Yeah, I mean, the, the unpeated, that, that is the tomato, um, the tomato spirit. It is, as I say, lightly sweet and quite fruity. Um, would be the, the two main sort of descriptors for that. The this the peated, which is it actually it's a strange one. Initially, when we started doing the peated um, malt uh, in the distillery, it was only about fifteen to eighteen parts per million. In the last few years, we've been up near a forty, sometimes up to over forty parts per million. But it doesn't come through even in the new made spirit. Um, you know, it, it's not like an Ardbeg or a Lafroy or anything like that. We don't get that instant smokiness. It is much more subtle um, so that you still get that fruity notes and the sweet notes that you'll find in the unpeated. It's just got this added dimension of having a subtle smokiness there that sometimes you'll actually nose the glass. <coughs> Excuse me. You'll nose the glass and you'll actually think, is this the wrong malt they've sent this because you sometimes don't even detect it on the nose um mm -hmm. which is quite frightening uh, in these days of covid especially but um it's uh it's a case of it's so subtle but when you taste it the initial second or two on the tongue it's very sweet and then you get that smokiness coming out um so the two spirits are very similar in the the basic style of being fruity and sweet it's just you've got this added dimension of the smoky character. And we do change the cut points now as well. Um, we reduce them slightly for the, the peated malt. Um, but the, the change in character and the spirit isn't huge other than the smoky dimension to it. So, so overall, even though you are lowering the cut point, that was going to be my next question, even though you're lowering the cut points very slightly to capture those, those, those uh, phenolic elements, are you still keeping them generally relatively high? To yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, our cut point for the, the tomato spirit is 65% ABV, which is quite high. Uh, and we're at 62 for the Kubokan. And I might even take that down to 60. Um, but even that is still relatively high compared with some in the industry. Yeah. You know, it's lower than others. There, there is no rights and wrongs. Um, it's just personal preference for each distillery. You know, so I couldn't say that 65 is the ideal cut point because that may not suit every distillery. So that <laughs> it works well for us and it gives us that lighter, softer, sweet, fruity type character. Um, but yeah, for the, for the peated malt, we want to lower it slightly to capture more of the phenolic notes. But, but even then, it's still very lightly peated when you have to come to it in the glass. No, that's that's really interesting. I've, I've spoken to a few people who are run, running peated distilleries that are, that are in the, that slightly lighter peated area and they're saying that they said similar things to you that when you get this, the new make you know straight off the still you kind of go wait a minute <laughs> something goes terribly wrong here and it's actually you know talking to the couple of them it's actually only sort of even like a year into cask or even 18 months into cask that that those elements really start to become more more evident again on the nose which i think is absolutely yeah. fascinating another another little sort of quirk of the magic of whiskey exactly yeah exactly because there, there is no good reason for it but it, it just it happens to be the way that it works in some spirits. You know, it stays hidden in the background and then comes through more on the palate than on the nose. Uh, and that's, that's part of why I like it as much as I do, because it's, it's almost like a, an extra surprise when you taste it. You know, so 
it's it's one of the things I've always tried to strive for in all the whiskies I've been involved in um, is to have some sort of complexity in there. I really do like whiskies that when you add a splash of water, you find something different. Because to me, that shows that there's so much layers of complexity there. And that's what makes the whiskey more interesting. If it's just one flavor coming through and that's it, it can, can get a, a wee bit uninteresting. So the more layers of flavors you can you can have in there, the better, as far as I'm concerned. I agree. Hmm. Just actually on that point, I just went back to the... UK exclusive after having tried this 1990 for the last half hour and there's just so many different flavors coming through that we never got the first time around or I certainly never there's almost yeah. like a coffee um syrup type of element coming through to it now um I don't even know where that would be coming from but totally different whisk altogether Moa how about you did you have any questions that you wanted to ask Graham yeah, I was going to go back to the Fino as well because I'm just curious about the finishing because it's is it been finished for five years um, it will be finished for just under just under five years, yeah. Yeah, because it's just it's a very long time for a finish if you compare to what you hear from a lot of other distilleries. So I was just mm -hmm. curious about how how you choose the spirit to go into these casts. Of course, you were talking about how in, intriguing it was to get these casts and get to try them out. So how do you choose the spirit to go into the cast, and how do you kind of get about choosing how long it will stay in? Um, yeah, I mean, it, we, we looked at nine-year-old because what we thought was around about the nine-year-old. So that, right, if we give it, let's say, three years, that's going to take it up to around about a 12-year-old, um, which might work quite well. Um, as it turned out, the, the whiskey was actually withstanding the phenol much better than that, so we could leave it slightly longer. And it's, it's one of those things that, even in, if you take, like, so for instance, our 14 year old, we have some of the, the Tawny Port casks finishing for about five years, maybe even six, in fact, occasionally. But we also have ones that are maybe a year and a half, two years. So the average will be somewhere about two and a half to three years. And that's kind of the norm for what I would want to use for finishing. Um, I know there are some places that will use it after a year, a year and a half. And that, that is fine if that suits their whiskey. I have no problem with that whatsoever. But I actually find that Tomatin can withstand a, a bit longer in the finishing cask because the flavours we've got are, are relatively robust. You know, they're still quite soft and delicate, but they are still quite robust at the same time. So that a slightly longer finish seems to work quite well with the Tomatin spirit. And that's maybe why in its past, you know, back in the 70s, as I say, when it was the biggest single malt distillery in Scotland, it was being used in everyone else's blends because it actually was strong enough, robust enough, powerful enough to be in a blend and still not be hidden away. And it's maybe slightly something the same when you come to that, you're finishing that a slightly longer period in a finished cast can actually evolve into something that bit even more special. Mm. But it, to a certain extent, trial and error. Yeah, I think it's nice about the tomato expressions because I never feel, or at least for the ones I've tried so far, that the cast takes over. There's still that kind of character underneath, which I think is lovely. And lately I've come across a lot of people online that have been so set in their ways. They only want a specific age, or they only want a specific kind of type of whiskey. And yeah. some people almost look down on finishing because they just automatically yeah. think that it's just a, a kind of marketing thing. So I think it's yeah. lovely just to hear this kind of, focus on flavor and how it develops and knowing your spirits yeah it is i mean it's, i said it earlier I, I do think that that finishing or however you want to call it but it's normally called finishing i think it gets really a bit of bad press which is unjustified i think on occasions yes it's it's probably been in the past used for the wrong reasons but i think if it's used for the right reasons and done in the right way with proper care and attention it's it's a fantastic instrument for us to be able to use to create a slightly new flavour profile to generate that complexity and the interest that's in the whiskey. Yeah, definitely. Well, we have now just crossed the nine o'clock threshold, so we can we can now swear um, if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> no, I 
I think that is a perfect time to wrap up. I think we've answered a huge amount of questions that came in and thank you to everyone uh, who sent in questions ahead of time and who also asked questions throughout the show. Uh, Christopher, wonderful to have you on again and thank you very much for your insight into the sherry industry and for your questions. And Moa, it was fantastic to um, have you on for the first time and learn a little bit more about what you've been doing down in Edinburgh and uh, finding out more about your process of dissecting testing notes and things um i think before we go guys let people know where they can find you if they've not found you on uh, social media beforehand Get you for <laughs> go ahead well i i'm swedish i like whiskey and i'm a girl so you'll find me at swedish whiskey girl uh, on instagram and basically the same on youtube uh, if you want to check me out there you can catch us, at, uh, we're at whiskeymag.com, uh, we're at Whiskey Magazine on uh, Twitter and Instagram, and I'm personally at, um, at Quercus Alba, because I like complicated user handles that people can't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Nerd. And of yeah. course, such a massive thank you for having us on, and it was brilliant listening to you both and trying these brilliant expressions. Well, thank you. Yeah, you enjoyed thank you having you. This is a really great whiskey. Cheers, guys. Yeah. A, a, a massive cheers to you, Graham, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, Graham. Uh, just on that note, if you're looking for Graham, he can be found upstairs in Warehouse 6 next to a cat. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone who's joined us tonight, and thank you, guys. Slanjava. 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 Slanjava.